Jesus made some interesting statements that in our modern society we find a hard time living up to because a lot of times people have been told that they need to compromise or they need to come to a mutual conclusion that sometimes is wrong but in order to make progress they say that it's right and that's sometimes called situational ethics or the moral imperative to create some type of environment where you can make something as an absolute only work in a resolution way that once you resolve it together you can change the absolute and so they're constantly changing rules regulations words meanings adapting things and often that is used in politics and morals of a society and in law but Jesus said something interesting that was contrary to what everybody else was used to hearing. He said, when you say yes, mean yes. When you say no, mean no. Because anything else is sin. So, when you say yes, don't say yes unless you mean it. In other words, don't go back on your word. Become a man of your word. Because the word says to be like the word. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, and your children will thank you. Because if you go back on your word, if you make a statement that you haven't thought about, if you decide on something that you hadn't really considered, and then you suddenly start changing what yes is to no, or changing what no was to yes, then whoever understands you and knows what you mean. Because if your circumstances can change, then again, does that mean that your word changes according to your circumstance? So, before you open your mouth, lots of times, we need to think about what we're saying. We need to stand up at times in the world so that being a light of the world, being an answer to people for the reason for the hope that lies within us, we need to be very clear on how we say something and what we say we mean and if we mean what we say. Because the Bible was written and it means what it says. That's pretty clear. God said he, he wrote it, he instructed it, it's meant to teach us, to guide us, to provide for us. It's his way of his Holy Spirit taking something that's inanimate, which is true. A lot of people that don't understand the Word of God will say it's just a book, it's just inanimate. Well, they're right in one way. Without the Holy Spirit, it is inanimate. It's just a book. But, when the person reading it has the Spirit of God in them to be able to reveal to them what it means and apply it personally, then it becomes the living Word of God. It's only living if it goes into something that has the receptivity by way of the Holy Spirit to make it alive to a person. And only God himself can do that. A person that just reads it is just going to get what they read. They're not going to understand it as meaning what it says and says what it means. Because that's how God speaks. What he says, he does. He says, I'm not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man, or no, I'm not a man that I should lie. And that we really have to become like God in some ways in the world we live in because too many times people will change or rearrange your words to make you sound like you didn't say what you said. So my wife knows this about me, is that if I say yes, I mean yes, up, up until the place where I say no. <laughs> because if I'm going in a certain direction and God says all of a sudden stop, I'll say, well, honey, I'm sorry, we said yes, but now God said no, so I'm not going to go there. But when I say no, even if I'm wrong, I just go ahead and stand on it, because guess what? I can ask forgiveness for what I've done wrong or said wrong, but... If I start changing what I've already done, then I'm no longer consistent. I no longer mean what I say and say what I mean. You need to develop that in your own life and stand up for it because if you do, God will honor you as an ethical, moral, and a person that simply says yes is yes and no is no. In Tozer, bold men needed in the warfare of the soul. Neither count I myself dear to myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry to which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 
Acts 20, 24. The church at this moment needs men, the right kind of men, old men. The talk is that we need revival, that we need a new baptism of the Spirit, or that God knows we must have both. But God will not revive mice. In other words, why should he revive sheep? They're just being sheared. He will not fill rabbits with the Holy Ghost. We languish for men who feel themselves expendable in the warfare of the soul, who cannot be frightened by the threats of death because they have already died to the allurements of this world. The, nothing, the world holds nothing dear to them, and they hold nothing dear to the world. Such men will be free from the compulsions that control and squeeze weaker men into changing their minds. This kind of freedom is necessary if we are to have prophets in our pulpits again instead of mascots. These free men will serve God and mankind from motives too high to be understood by the rank and file of religious entertainers, who today shuttle in and out of the sanctuary, often with much fanfare. They will make no decisions out of fear, nor will circumstance dictate their decision making, take no course out of a desire to please, nor will they be satisfied with the applause of men. Accept no service for financial considerations, because finances are regulated by God himself, and they have no need of anything else but God. Perform no religious act out of mere custom, because their custom is to seek the Lord daily and to do as he says to do. Nor will they allow themselves to be influenced by the love of publicity, for the public will often change its mind, and whether they succeed or whether they fail, they continue on irregardless. Or the desire for reputation, because in fact, their reputation started of no account, and they will end of no account, simply doing the things that Jesus said they should do. The true church has never sounded out public expectations before launching her crusades. Her leaders heard from God, they knew their Lord's will and did it. It was that simple, they were of nothing, and so they became something only because God received the glory. Their people followed them, sometimes to triumph, oftener to insults and public persecution, and their sufficient reward was the satisfaction of being right in a wrong world. It's easy to be political and to get involved in the political process, because then you are part of the system. But when you stand as a light, in the light, then you find that there are more important things to do than to be with those who feel they are right, as opposed to doing what God says to do, which is what makes you right. When God tells you to do something, and you do it, you're not wrong, though the world may say you're wrong according to its system and its ways. But if you're faithful to do what God says to you to do each and every day, then what he calls you is obedient. And you'll find that to obey is better than sacrifice. And it's so much easier to not have to worry about the circumstances as much as the person of Jesus instructing you in what you should do today.